So the topic of this talk is um, Inside Spirit X3. Quick agenda. We'll uh, have a quick overview. Um, I don't think I'll have enough time to go through that in detail, but most of it I'm guessing that you already know. So we'll ha go through that very quickly. Parser combinators too, we'll go through that very quickly. Um, then we'll go to start building a toy Spirit X3. Um, for that, for that exercise, the hope is that um, we'll have a simple example of Spirit. That way, um, you'll be able to understand the concepts behind the library. And then we'll go to a walkthrough of the actual Spirit library, X3 library. Um, we'll go through some of, not all of course, but some of the important parts of the code. That way you have a deeper understanding of um, how Spirit, work, Spirit X3 works. Okay, so I'm guessing that I don't have to go through all this. You, you, I'm, I'm assuming that you already know this, what spirit is. Um, maybe um, a, a quick question. Who among you uh, don't know spirit yet? Okay, so do you want me to uh, go to this slide or um, is it okay to um, uh, skip this slide? Okay, now Spirit X3. What is Spirit X3? Uh, it's an experimental version of Spirit. It's um, using uh, lots of features of C++11. It's hackable. At least that's what I intend it to be. And it has a very simple design. Uh, compared to V2, um, X3 will be so much more simpler, simpler to understand. It has a minimal code base and dependencies. So um, it's still relying on MPL. I can't live without MPL. Although I tried to, I tried to uh, find uh, a way to have some minimal type list mechanisms. It just is not good enough. So um, why reinvent the wheel? So you have MPL. Fusion, same. I can't live without Fusion. So uh, that's it. So uh, Fusion will have to be there. I tried as much as I can with Spirit X2 to minimize the dependencies, but um, there are really th uh, things that I can't live without. How about Phoenix? Okay, Phoenix, uh, well, um, s Phoenix is my baby, uh, literally and figuratively. So I'm um, quite attached to it, but with, uh, Spirit X3, I'm not relying on it anymore. I'm not depending on Spirit um, Phoenix anymore. Um, particularly because we have um, C++11 Lambda. And because um, when Spirit 2 came out, the focus was not on semantic actions anymore. The focus was more on attributes and attribute handling. We'll see more about that as we go through the slides. Okay, um, how about Proto? Uh, this will be a contentious one. Um, I know it will be, uh, I might sound, um, you know, uh, sacrilegious to many of you if I say that I won't be depending on Proto anymore. Or at the very least, I will sound uncool because, well, Proto is a cool library. But I'm, I'm keeping an open mind. And um, since I heard Eric's talk on Proto uh, for C++11, I, I am quite amazed. But the bottom line is that, well, um, one word, cost. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Proto is quite expensive at compile time, and for two things. Um, why, I, why I can't justify the cost, two things. One, the expression template part of the library amounts to less than 5% of the total code base. 
So it's a small part. And number two, well, I love writing expression template code. I love writing the overloads. I love designing the, um, the expression trees. I love doing that. And I will show that it's easy to do. And for the purpose of spirit, um, I would um, say that at some point, when you have a simple uh, expression template grammar, uh, it's best to do it hand-coded. That's my opinion. Anyway, so because of that, because we have minimal code base dependencies and, and we have a simpler design, um, we'll have faster compile times. And one of the goals, uh, I, for, I skipped over that, we'll have uh, one of the in, intent is to have better error handling as well. Yes, Michael? No. Um, I can't live without MPL. I can't live, okay, repeat the question. Um, Michael is asking if I have to get rid of all of this to minimize the dependencies. So the answer is, I can't get rid of MPL. I can't get rid of Fusion. I can live without Phoenix because we have C++ 11. And I can live without Proto because, well, I enjoy writing the um, expression template code. And um, unfortunately, the cost of Phoenix, both Phoenix and Proto, is a bit too steep. And I want to minimize um, the compilation time. That's one of the uh, strongest arguments against using Spirit. The compilation time is too, you know, well. You know what I mean, I guess. OK. To give you a hint, I've ported the COC4 CPP example from version v2. And this is the, the compile time that I'm getting. Um, this is using a virtual machine. Uh, uh, unvirtualized, this will be um, so much faster. But you can see that it's twice faster. OK, so um, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. What's a parser combinator? Well, a parser is a function. Uh, an example is a character parser. Another example is a numeric parser. Those are all functions. Parser can be composed to form higher order parser functions. So for example, you have a sequence parser accepting two parsers, uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. You form that into an aggregate which is a sequence parser. Such a higher order parser function is called a parser combinator in the function programming domain. A parser combinator accepts several parsers as input and returns a composite parser as a result. Here's how it is for, uh, as an example. So you compose small parsers to have more complex parsers. OK, so uh, here are a couple of examples. We have primitives and the pseudocode below it. Sequences match this and this in sequence. Alternatives match F1 and F2 in sequence. Modifiers, you have the clean class, etc. cetera. Um, for example, the example there is the clean. So it's matching zero or more of f, so it's invoking f zero or more times until it fails, and it returns through, through because um, you have zero or more match. OK, so um, all of this is based on a uh, language, which is uh, the parsi parsing expression grammar. It's a formal grammar for describing formal languages. Um, in terms of a set of rules to recognize strings of this language. Um, it doesn't require tokenization stage. You don't need a lexer. But of course, you can use a lexer if you want. And in fact, Spirit version 2 has a lexer. Unlike EBNF, PEGs are not ambiguous. Exactly one valid parse tree for each PEG. 
any PEG can be represented as a recursive descent parser. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, it has a different interpretation as EB and F. Uh, most particularly, we have greedy loops. So it will match as much as, uh, it will try to parse as much as it can without regard for the tail. We have alternatives, um, which is a, a first come for serve basis. So the first one that matches wins. Yes, question? Not yet at this time. So our, at this time, what's ported is the key part. Um, if you, I'm um, sorry, repeat the question. Uh, uh, David was asking if uh, X3 will not have, a, will have a lexer is, or will not have a lexer. Is that the question? So the answer is that um, X3 will have a lexer in due time. It's not yet ported. So what we have is the parser, is the a PEG parser portion. We don't have karma yet, which is the output generation. We don't have the lexer yet. So it's just PEG at this time, the key part of um, spirit. Okay, here's an example. And I guess that's just reiterating what's been mentioned in a previous slide. And here's how it happens. So um, you, you can see uh, the diagrams here, how the small parsers, all of these are parsers. And they are combined to form higher order parsers. So you have the integer, which is a primitive parser. And you have these literals. This is a non-terminal which is also a parser, and then another parser. Then you can combine these three to form a sequence following that. And then you combine all that to form an alternative. So this thing over here represents that PAG expression over there. And this is the pseudocode generated by Spirit based on um, the composition of the parsers. OK, so um, that was quick. Let's build the Toy Spirit X3. Let's see how it goes. Hopefully, um, at the end of this exercise, you'll have a um, deeper understanding of how Spirit works. And um, the point that I'm trying to get across is that um, it is easy. It is easy to understand. And uh, my purpose is that um, I need people to contribute to the code. <laughs> OK, so we start with the parser base class. This is the root of the expression template 3. So um, I'm pretty sure you know all this, how this works. This is the um, canonical CRTP class. I'm just wanting to mention here that it's in namespace Boost Spirit X3. All of the components that I will um, go through in the um, subsequent slides, I will not be um, writing that um, namespace. So everything is under its Spirit namespace X3. OK, so that's a typical a CRTP class. And all derived parsers inherit from that. So that's the root of all parsers. All derived parsers shall have a parse member function with that signature. It's a template. You have the uh, uh, iterators, iterator range, first, last, pointing to the input stream. Those are forward iterators. And you have the context. This is a very important concept that I, I will discuss in the next slides. So these are the post conditions for the parse member function. Upon return from a parser, from a parse, the following post conditions should hold. First, on a successful match, 
first, the first iterator is positioned one past the last matching character. You can notice that it's passed by reference. So the parser moves that iterator to one past the last position that's matching. On a failed match, first is restored. So that's um, quite simple to understand. Um, I guess you, I don't have to explain this part, but um, it just uh, happens that um, uh, because spirit can be used without Elixir, there's what we call the skip parser. And the skip parser skips the trailing spaces before parsing. So this is this happens uh, for all the primitive parsers. For example, you have the car parser and you have the numeric parser. Before it starts doing its business, it will try to skip the white spaces before it, defined by the um, skip parser. So what's just th what this says is that um, there will be no post skips, only pre skips. Okay, so um, to show you how easy it is, this is actually the um, complete parser, the complete character parser. So um, it's a simple class, one member variable, which is the car. It's, it's templated, but it's a template, templated by the car type, can be a car or uh, W car T. And here's what's important, the parse function. So um, I guess I don't have to explain what this does. So it, it uh, tries to match the character that you have with what's in the input and advances the iterator appropriately and returns false if there's no match. So it's... Yes, um, you, you see that the iterator is not incremented only if you have a match this part here. So it returns true, returns, uh, the iterator is positioned one after. So in this case, uh, the iterator is not moved. Okay, now here's the ET. How can it be easier? So just uh, if you want a car parser, you'll have just to create a car parser using that function. So that function is the eat expression template um, for that particular parser. For those who have used spirit and sp uh, spirit v2, uh, the car underscore uh, will, should be quite familiar. Okay, now, um, Let's move on to a composite parser. This is the sequence parser, and that's it. It fits in one slide. Yes? Oh, okay. Um, how do I match any character? Well, yes, um, this is a Toy Spirit X3. And um, for the purpose of um, explanation, I simplified a lot. But um, uh, the, the actual parser, the actual car parser, uh, will be a, a little bit more complex than that. But for uh, uh, what I'm trying to get across is um, the simplicity of the design to get, uh, to have you get the idea of how everything works. And actually, the, the actual code is not um, so much more complex than what you have here. Okay, so here's the sequence parser. It's templated the left and the right, assumed to, are assumed to be um, parsers. It's inheriting from the parser base class, passing its type you know, the CRTP um, technique. 
in its constructor, it's taking in the left and the right parsers. So it's composing. So here you have the left and right composed from that one. And you have the main parse function, which I think should be immediately understandable to all of you guys. So it tries the first uh, left. If not, it will re uh, return immediately, return false immediately because of short circuiting. If, uh, if this is successful, the first parse uh, iterator will be positioned appropriately for the right pars uh, parser to be tried. So that's actually um, working code in our toy parser. And the, here's the expression template for that parser. So um, we have an overload. Sorry, where is that? Oh, there you go. Overload for the um, right shift operator. And then it's taking in a parser for the left operand and another parser for the right operand. And it composes, as simple as that. So um, here's another um, composite parser. You can see it fits in one slide. It's very small. I like small classes. I like um, small and one purpose classes. And this is another example of the composite parser. So it's the same as the sequence parser, but the logic is different. This is how alternatives are parsed. And there's an appropriate expression template overload for the alternative parser. Same as before, you have the right hand side and the left hand side parsers. You combine that and create a composite parser. OK, so far? Great. OK, now here's one thing that's um, very nice with um, C++ 11 you have auto. And with auto, you can uh, create, with just the parsers that we have, we can have simple rules like this, which works. For example, this is a sequence of A followed by B followed by C, and that works. It's a sequence parser, it's a sequence of a sequence, actually. And that works. Same thing with this one. You have A or B followed by C. So you have the expression template, and that creates a composite parser, and you can call its parse member function, and it does the right thing. So it's very tight. It's very small. Even with that, you can um, have um, small parsers. The code is very tight. The code is very lean. It does what it's supposed to do. And uh, it's the, the, you don't have a code bloat at all, and it's very simple. So what I'm trying to do is uh, separate the uh, uh, core parsers, the things that you really need, into a very small minimal subset uh, for um, people to use so that you, you, you don't have to um, uh, have all this whole set of bag of parsers. You need have a minimal set to play around with. Um, this is especially good for um, writing s small micro parsers. For example, um, uh, say, for example, you'd like to parse a complex number. So that's uh, how you do it. OK, so but how about recursion? Say I want to parse these inputs, x, a followed by x, a, a, x, and any number of x, um, a terminated by x. So in other words, I want zero or more a's followed by x. Uh, OK, oh, you, you can do that using the clean star. But for this purpose of uh, the, the toy parser, we don't have this clean star yet. So uh, I'd like to introduce how rules are implemented using x3. And this is the way to explain it. So we, we want to have something that can recurse.
<clears throat> Can we do that using auto only? Here's a try. And then that. But can you see the problem? Yeah, dependency. So x depends on ax, and ax depends on x. That's a problem. So that's why we need rules. We need rules that can recurse. Um, auto is very powerful as it is, but um, you can't have recursive auto definitions. Okay, non-terminals. The rule is a polymorphic parser that acts as a name placeholder capturing the behavior of a PG EG expression assigned to it. So you have a right-hand side expression. You want to name it? You, you assign it to a rule. It's uh, something like what we did a while ago using auto, but this time we can do recursion. But how can we do that? Okay. Naming a PEG expression allows it to be referenced later and makes it possible for the rule to call itself. Obviously, you can't do that with auto because you, you can't have uh, the left, the name of the, um, the variable be on the right-hand side of the um, uh, equation. That's not possible. So this is one of the most important mechanisms and the reason behind the word recursive in the recursive descent parsing. OK. In spirit in classic style, um, we have spirit 2 and we have the classic uh, spirit. We were using um, abstract type erased functions in spirit Classic, we used um, virtual functions. And in Boost, uh, in Spirit 2, we are using Boost or standard functions. So uh, in a way, we are uh, hiding the types using type erasure. So for ex here's an example using Spirit 2. So same as example as before, implemented for Spirit 2. So when you assign this um, expression to x, it will hold it as a boost function. Same thing with the ex. But there are problems with type erasure. All temp template parameters should be known beforehand. Hence, need, uh, the rule needs to know the scanner type in classic spirit, if you remember classic spirit. And in um, v2, you need to know the iterator type. And that is why in the previous slide, you specify the iterator type for the rule. And I'm not even mentioning about the context. So it, the, that's a big problem that we have because um, you'll have to always specify uh, the types if you use type erasure. OK. Code bloat, that's a big problem with virtual functions as well because um, all um, virtual functions are instantiated always, even if you don't use it. And so it prevents optimizations. So the virtual function is an opaque wall. Um, uh, in general, compilers cannot see beyond that wall and cannot pe perform optimizations. Well, there's link time optimization, but um, I don't want to di digress. OK, so X3 style. X3 style does not use um, the boost function, does not use type erasure, does not use um, virtual functions. It is inspired by the uh, spirit classic subrules, well, taken to the next level with the help of C11. Oh, the big difference is that in V2 and in classic, the subrules are compile time monsters relying on expression templates. So this time with X3, I implemented it a bit differently to make it more easier to compile. OK, so let's go back to the context. 
the context is an important um, component of Spirit X3. Um, it's, we have the context in Spirit X2 as well, but it's not used quite as extensively as we do it with X3. So what is the context? The uh, context allows functions to efficiently access data from other stack frames. So you have recursive functions. You have this function calling this function, calling this function. I'd like to be able to get context information from this outer function in this inner function. So the way to do that is through the context. Uh, the data is in demand. You get the data instead of data being pushed through you um, as you do with um, arguments, function arguments. It's an efficient alternative to passing arguments to functions, in fact. So instead of uh, pushing lots of variables that um, uh, uh, um, the colleague uh, can uh, take, you'll just pass in the context to some variables in your stack frame and make that available to other stack frames. Data can cross multiple stack frames and allows multiple con uh, contexts to be linked up. So here's the context, um, the simplified version of the context. What is the concept? It is basically like a fusion map. You have the key, which is the ID. You have the data type, T. And you have a reference to the next context. And it, it, you have two variables here, which are references to a value and the reference to the next context. So. Um, Basically, it's like an element of a fusion map. One context is like an element of a fusion map. And context can be linked together, like a linked list. So you have this context, which has this data, and points to the next context, and so on and so forth, until you have the empty context at the end. So searching goes this way. So it tries to search the first context with a, a, a similar same ID. If it has that, it returns successfully. If not, it will try the next context and then the next context. Interestingly, um, this is very efficient. You might think that uh, it is a, a linear time operation, but it's not. Because of compiler optimizations, and I, I have code testing that, it's a zero one operation. So you get the um, value immediately because of compiler optimizations. So you have the empty context at the end. So um, as I mentioned, uh, this, it's, uh, it's like a linked list of contexts. You have context one, then context two, pointing to context three. At the very end, you have the empty context, which returns nothing. Here's an example. You have two contexts and the empty context. So all linked. The first context points to an integer. The second context points to a do double. And the first context is specified by the ID foo. The next context is specified by the ID var. So if I want to get the context bar, I will get this part. And it's very fast. So here's an example of a context usage. Foo is calling bar. Here in foo, we set up a context, an integer, and then the context with the full ID and the type int and pointing to the empty context as its next context. So there's only one element in that context. And then when it calls bar, it passes in that context. And then we in bar, it accesses, it gets the um, context specified by the ID foo full ID using this guy over here. 
So um, as you can expect, the printout will be 1 to 3. Pardon? Oh, OK. Thanks. OK, so here's the setting up of the context. And here's the access, accessing the context. So same ID, full ID, and full ID. And this int here, you pass a reference to that, this variable here, i. So the output of this one here will be 1, 2, 3. Um, is that clear enough? OK. Ah, question? Um, this one? Which one? I. I. So it's always passed by, um, uh, because um, you have the actual variables in the stack. And the context is actually just uh, referencing that variable. Don't worry about the const reference. It, it's, I, I promise you, it's very fast. Um, uh, I, I've ha I have a test for this one. Um, getting the variable here, compiler optimizes that very well, and you just get a, a constant. In this particular case, yes, I will collapse to a constant. Okay, so um, to ha get the rules running, working, we need two parts. The rule definition and the rule itself. So these are new concepts um, introduced in um, Spirit X3. The first thing that I'm going to tackle is the rule definition. Rule definition is specified by an ID in the right hand side. So it encapsulates the right-hand side in the class itself. So when you, when you construct a rule definition, you need to pass it in the RHS, the right-hand side. And how does it do the actual parsing? This is um, important and um, uh, quite um, tricky, in fact. What happens here is that before parsing the RHS, right, the right-hand side, it sets up a context which references the right-hand side parser. Okay? So this thing over here is specified there in this context. The reason is that the right-hand side, any node inside the right-hand side of the, uh, the parser will have access to this context, the context of this rule definition. If you have an ID, if you know the ID of the rule, then you'll be able to get the right-hand side of the rule through the context. And then we have the rule. So uh, this is a bit of a um, tri tricky part now because the rule is empty. Doesn't have any variables. But what does the parse function do? It tries to get the context, the right-hand side, in fact, from the context because it knows the ID. And it know, because it knows the ID, it's also able to have this operator overload here, which is um, a weird way to have an assignment operator. But this is done. Uh, it's a const. It doesn't do anything. It's an empty class anyway, so it can't do anything to mutate itself. Instead, it returns a rule definition. Because when you have this, when you're assigning the definition 
to the rule, you have the definition there, and we will create a rule definition from that with the same ID as we have. Any questions so far? Uh, this might be um, too, um, am I uh, going through too quickly? Yes? Yes. Uh, you can't, in fact. Okay, the question is, um, the, you, you supply the ID, but um, what if you have conflicting IDs? Um, there will be a compile time error. You can't do that. So there will be a conflict. When you combine them together, there will be a conflict. Yes? Yes, so um, the question is, do we have um, the rule and the rule definition? Uh, what's the difference between the two? Did I get the question correctly? Okay, so the rule definition knows about the right-hand side. The rule itself does not. Because when you create a rule, you don't have a right-hand side yet. But when you have a rule and you assign a right-hand side parser, uh, parser expression, then what happens is that the rule here will create a rule definition and return that to you. You can capture that using auto. We'll see that later. So here, here's what's happening. So we have a rule. You don't have a right-hand side yet. You're just declaring the rule. Because it's recursive, you don't know the right-hand side yet. It has to follow later. AX is defined like we did before using auto. But this time, AX, you can ha have the rule as one of its parts there. Okay, now here's the tricky part. Here's the nice part here. Here's the start of the grammar. What this does is this part over here, X is a rule, right? And it gets assigned the right hand side, which is the parser uh, expression that we're interested in. And when you assign it, to x, it calls this member function. It calls this member function here, which returns a rule definition. And then that rule definition, this one actually is a composite, which is a rule definition. And it gets captured by the start rule here. And that works. It works. So um, here's what's happening. When you call start, it will call the rule definition parse member function. And in, in the parse member function, it will set up a context which will point to this right hand side specified by this ID. This is your ID. Okay, now it parses, it calls this one and this one. It calls, when it calls AX, it calls this rule here. When it's time to go to the X part of the sequence, the X part accesses the context specified by this ID, 
which is this one over here, and it calls it topaz. Yes, question. Do you have a get parser function on the rules so you could do that in two lines? Yeah, um, that'll be uh, nice to have. Uh, and, and a lot more. Um, uh, the context is a very powerful mechanism, and um, uh, there, there can be uh, lots of um, helper functions for doing that. So, um, yes, uh, you're right. Um, it will be um, a lot um, nicer if we have something like get rule with the ID and then the context. Is that what uh, you're saying? So it'll be easier. Case, I was just thinking if you wrote x equal the rest of that expression, and then on the next line, autocomp start equal x dot get parser or something like that, you'd make it a little plainer what was happening instead of the odd double assignment. Oh, OK. Um, let's discuss that um, offline. <laughs> um, there, there, uh, there, there can be lots of improvement to the um, interface, of course. Okay, so here's how um, I currently um, encapsulate the grammar. So uh, uh, we still have the grammar, but uh, there, there are easier ways to um, create parsers. Here's one, based on our previous example, just uh, using um, const objects. So we, I have a definition inside the namespace, and I host hoist the um, grammar that I'm interested with, which is this one, pertaining to this one over here. So you can use this immediately as a parser. OK, so um, looks like I'm on time, or not. <laughs> so I'll go through the walkthrough of Spirit X3, um, the actual code, so just to get a um, a uh, more deeper, even deeper understanding of um, what uh, we have in the actual code itself. Um, just examples here, so um, I won't go through all the details, but you can see the pattern. And this is actual code, it, 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 this is not the toy anymore. This is actual code of X3 that you're seeing here. And most of the uh, slides here fit in one page. So um, uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, it's simple to understand. Uh, there are simple classes. There are um, one-shot classes. And uh, this is an example. The, the simplest parser is the EPS parser. So um, same as before, almost, but we added an attribute, which is um, quite important with Spirit, um, starting from Spirit v2. The attribute is the way to get the data from the parse. So here's what an EPS parser does. First, order of business, try to skip spaces. And then what the EPS does is just returns true. Always um, parses true. So what's new here? The attribute. We'll get into that a little bit later. And the unused type. Yes, question? Um, OK, the question is, um, are we moving to a pure attribute-based um, parsing and uh, no support for semantic actions? Um, the answer is no. Uh, we'll still be supporting semantic actions uh, using C++ 11 Lambda, and possibly still support mm, optionally Phoenix. OK. So attributes. <clears throat> All parsers expose an attribute specific to their type. For example, the int parser exposes an int. The car parser exposes a car. The clean star with an int as a subject exposes a std vector of ints. The sequence int 
followed by a car is exposed with the attribute of a fusion DQ with an int and a car. This one and this one. Some parsers may have unused don't care attributes. One such example is the EPS parser, the one that we have a while ago. It doesn't have an attribute. That is why we have the unused type as the attribute. And you have this flag here specifying that, okay, this guy doesn't need any attributes, doesn't have attributes. So these are um, further examples of parsers with no attributes. Okay, so um, we've categorized um, attributes this way. So we have the un unused attributes, the plain attribute, for example, int, car double. We have the container attribute, uh, any kind of um, std container. A tuple attribute, any kind of um, fusion conforming sequence. A variant attribute, a boost variant. The optional attribute, using boost optional. Yes, question? Um, you can supply your own, in fact. So, uh, uh, I'll explain a little bit more later. Uh, there's uh, what we call, and actually I'll explain it in this slide. Your question will be explained in this slide. Okay, so here are the new attribute propagation rules. Um, we have something similar in Spirit V2 but I tried to um, rationalize a bit more and to refine it a bit more. Um, unlike before, we have just a whole attribute propagation scheme. So I tried to categorize that into three parts. First is attribute synthesis. What is attribute synthesis? Attribute synthesis is when a parser needs to synthesize an attribute. If you've noticed the um, parse member functions a while ago, you'll see that you can pass in an attribute, okay? But you may or may, you need not supply an attribute, in fact. You can just pass in an use type. That way, you're asking the parser to synthesize the attribute itself. So for example, if uh, this sequence is connected to a semantic action, and you don't have an attribute supplied, this uh, parser will have to synthesize that attribute in order for it to be passed on to the semantic action. And um, by uh, saying that, um, I guess um, I, I've given a hint to answer your question. So um, that's the attribute synthesis that we have. But we have here, um, another set of um, uh, 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 attribute um, uh, scheme, which is attribute compatibility. So because um, you can pass any, any type of attribute to your parser, it has to be able to uh, know which is compatible or which is not. And it is defined by these rules. So for example, you might say that any kind of tuple can be passed on to, um, to this uh, uh, sequence parser here, right? As long as you have that um, A uh, will have an attribute of T and B will have an attribute of U. So any form of uh, fusion sequence can be passed in instead of tuple. So for example, you can uh, pass in a fusion list or an, uh, uh, um, um, struct of your own struct. This is adapted using f the fusion adapt um, sequence, if you know such thing. So um, 
any type of fusion sequence you can pass in as long as the elements have this type. But it's more than that. Um, actually, with this uh, rule here, with this um, at at attribute compatibility, um, we don't need the exact types as long as y um, the type there is compatible with um, the types of the, the um, uh, attribute types of the sp specific rules itself. So um, um, that may be a, a bit confusing. Um, but um, there are attribute compatibility rules here that's specified uh, in the documentation. So um, in this example, in this particular example, the sequence A followed by B can definitely take in a tuple. But it goes beyond that. It can also take in a vector because the sequence A and B is compatible with a vector, stood vector, as long as one of these holds, as long as A has an attribute of T and B has an attribute of T as well, or as long as A has an attribute of vector T and B has an attribute of a T, and so on and so forth. So these are the rules. These are the compatibility rules. So these vectors are compatible with this sequence as long as these things hold, one of these things hold. And um, I also separated attribute collapsing. What is attribute collapsing? Ad, um, as you know, um, some parsers may have unused types. So for example, if A has a type T, and B has an ad attribute type unused, the result will be collapsed to just T. The unused part will be taken away. So same thing with this one. And if both A and B have unused attribute types, the result will be unused. So these are the rules for um, the sequence parser. Question? Yes. So this always holds. Oh, OK. Sorry. Repeat the question. Um, <clears throat> the question is, um, if A followed by B, the parser, the sequence parser, synthesizes a tuple with an unused type, will it be collapsed? Yes, the answer is yes. It will be collapsed. Actually, I'm interested in if A and B both synthesize tuples. Oh. Will it will be, uh, the synthesized attribute will be a tuple of tuples for X3. With, uh, with V2, it will be a flat tuple. Actually, um, I might be wrong. I have to look at the code. It might be an, uh, an, a fusion iterator range. I might be wrong. I, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, here's a very um, nifty utility that uh, we always use in Spirit. And in fact, it's also used uh, in, um, in Fusion. And uh, I, I stole the idea from um, Tuples uh, Ignore. Uh, it, there's a small class there called Swallow Assign. So what does it do? Uh, it can take it any any value at all and just throws it away. So it can take it any type, can assign to it. You can do that, but it doesn't do anything. It's an empty class. So it's like a sink, void sink. So it can take it anything. So we use that a lot for um, specifying unused types, for example.
Okay. So uh, we're here we're um, refining the context. We've uh, had a brief um, introduction when we uh, uh, went into the Toy Spirit uh, X3 parser. Here's the actual class that we have in the code base right now. So it's basically the same as before, a little bit more refined. The main difference between this and the toy is that we're using the unused type as the terminating context. So the unused type uh, masquerades as a context in this case. To do that, we add these member functions inside the unused class. So it uh, returns and uh, nothing. So if uh, you, it, does, uh, it doesn't care what ID you pass, it just returns nothing. So it's the terminating case, it's the end case. Okay, here's well, how the skip over look like. Pretty simple, it just skips over. But what's um, interesting here is that we don't need to pass in the context. We don't need to pass in the attribute. It doesn't need it. So again, we are using the unused type here to specify that we don't care. We don't care about the context. We don't care about the attribute. We just care that you skip all the um, um, spaces. Okay, so here's another um, primitive parser, the EPS parser. Uh, uh, okay, we've, we've had this before, right? <laughs> the only thing that needs to be done is to have the EPS itself, the expression template that we, uh, the user will use. So that's the EPS thing over here. Now, let's um, move on to an int parser. This is another uh, um, primitive parser. And uh, this is, uh, again, this is part of the code base. So that's how it looks exactly. Quite simple. So <clears throat> uh, we, we did our best to separate um, the main uh, logic from the parser itself, the main logic of parsing. So why? because um, our intention is for you to be able to use this um, simple utilities for parsing ints without having to, you know, um, take in a whole bunch of expression templates and all that um, nice things. So if you want to uh, have an, a very fast integer parsers, we have the extract int which is the uh, uh, logic behind what's happening in the int parsers. Again, the expression template part. Now, here's the clean parser. Again, it fits in one slide, but ex except for um, I separated the uh, logic for the parse itself to emphasize the point. Um, looks familiar, right? But there are a, few, a couple of um, things that we added. First, now it's inheriting from unary parser. So unary parser inherits from the base parser. So uh, all unary parsers uh, inherit from that. Um, it's just um, a refactoring of the parser tree. So you have at the, the topmost the parser class, that's the base, and you have your unary parser, and you have binary parsers. That's it. Here's the unary parser. It inherits from the base parser class, and it has a subject, one subject constructor takes in that subject and he, you have uh, some type deaths to, um, you know, to make it simple for and uh, uniform across the whole parser hierarchy. So you'll expect that for all unary parsers.
And here's the expression template for the clean parser. So you ha I overloaded the operator star and take in a subject. And I return a clean. But before doing so, I need to convert whatever this is into a valid parser, if possible. Sometimes it's not possible. So the ask parser here tries to convert a type into a valid parser. So it's quite simple. So it returns the composite clean parser passing in the subject. First, it has to convert the parser, uh, the subject to, to into a valid parser. Um, a little bit later, you'll see what happens if you try to pass in something that is not a parser. So that's where um, error handling comes in. So there you go. This is the crucial part here, the ask parser. And here's the ask parser um, definition. So we have the main template, which is empty. That's important. It's empty. And we have the function here that converts, tries to convert any type of parser, any type of um, uh, value, in fact, into a parser. There's specific cases, for example, um, the literal string or the literal uh, character can be converted to a parser. It's not a parser. Uh, for example, um, quote x, single quote, that's a literal character. It's not a parser. But it can be converted to a parser because we have specializations for that. For the in-use type, we have specialization for that. OK. We, have all, we also have a specialization for anything that is already a parser. So anything that is derived from parser base will be converted, uh, no, will be passed as is. So uh, you, you have the derived here, and it, it, it passes it as is. So it's already a parser, in fact. Parser base is the class that you need parser. Yes. Um, uh, uh, I didn't um, have that on a slide, but uh, they have the parser base, which is a, a, a base class of uh, the main parser uh, uh, template class. And the purpose of that is to have it easy to be recognized. Just uh, anything that is derived from that is already a parser. So there are other ways to do that, but the, this is quite simple. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's also a specialization for literals. For a car, for example, as parser for a car returns, well, a literal, a literal car parser. Okay, so here's the clean star implementation. Uh, I guess I don't have to explain that. It parses as much as it can greedily. Okay. Uh, this, I guess, I have to explain a little bit. Because the first, we have actually um, two overloads of the parse function for the clean. I'm a little bit running out of time, but I'll, I'll try my best. OK. This one is for the case where OK, sorry. OK. 
This one is for the case where you, um, the, the user passes in an uh, attribute. So in this case, we call this um, utility, which is parses into a container. We'll see more about that a little bit later. And this is how you parse into a container. So you, you get in, uh, try to get the attribute of the container type and tries to call the parser to do its thing and then calls pushback to stuff the value that this parser gets into the container. So it is assumed that attribute here is a container. OK, um, where, this part? OK. Uh, could, um, could, uh, could you please repeat? Yeah, OK, this is just for ex uh, explanation. Uh, you'll see later that this is not, uh, actually not actually what we are doing. Uh, this is the actual code. Um, this is just, um, I'm just trying to explain what's happening when you parse one element in a clean star. So this is uh, essentially what's happening. But we use traits. And you'll have here that we have customization points to get the container value, to initialize the value, and to push back into the attribute. This is where the fun stuff happens, where you have move and all this stuff. So unlike with Spirit V2, um, with X3, we always use move as much as we can. So here, um, it's not pushing back. It's doing the right thing. And it makes sense, because you don't need the value anymore once you push back, right? OK, so here's the sequence parser. We've seen this before. Um, the only addition is that we're deriving from binary parser, and we have the attributes. Essentially, the same as before. So here's the binary parser. It's like the unary, unary parser, but you have the left and right, and um, a bunch of some um, uh, type defs and static consts there to make it uniform for all binary parsers. And here's the sequence expression template. S same as you have in the clean, but this time you have the left and right. And it's the right shift operator we're overloading. But the same as before, if you, if you look at this, it's returning a sequence. But left and right, you don't know if these are parsers yet. So it tries to convert that into a parser. Take note of the value type, though. This is important. So it returns a sequence. This thing here returns a sequence. Now that value type is important because it gets into action when you have invalid expressions. Because the par you have the parser type, which is empty. Yes, question? Could you repeat that question again? The previous slide? This one? OK. Oh. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, the question is, um, uh, can we consider trailing return types instead of this um, uh, thing over here, that syntax here? Yes, definitely we can. OK, now, um, for invalid expressions, uh, I mentioned a while ago that um, the default parser template is empty. And because of that, when you have a T that, that, is, that can't be converted to par a parser, what I'm trying to say is that if you have a type T and there's no specializations for that, 
this um, main template will um, take into action. So because it, that's empty, Sfini will make that expression invalid. For example, so here's your clean star expression as parser and value type. And then you try to type in not a parser with a clean star. So what's happening? Since we don't have a specialization for not a parser here, there will be no value type because the main specialization is empty. The main specialization is empty. It doesn't have a value type. So because of Sfini, we'll have something like that. So it will not be part of the overload set. So that operator simply does not exist for this expression over here. And you'll get the ex error message exactly there. It will point to that exact line and exactly that position. Same thing with the sequence. Because we're using as parser as value type for the left part and for the right part, if you have a sequence expression that is not a parser, you'll have the same error message. No match for operator in term, not a parser. That's the exact message that you'll get, and it's very clear. OK, so here's the sequence parser implementation. Um, for the sequence parser, uh, it made sense to have it have two overloads. Uh, one for unused type attributes. Um, let me remind you that the parameter, the last parameter is always the attribute type. So once you pass in an unused type for the attribute, that means that you don't care about the attribute. This thing gets called. And this is the same as we have before in the toy example. In fact, exactly the same. And we have another overload for that. The case where we have the user passing in an attribute. So in that case, what we do is we call a utility function for parsing the sequence. But in this case, we are passing in the attribute category as well. Why is that? So the reason is that um, the, the sequence parser can take in an attribute of a tuple type. But at the, at the same time, there's what we mentioned a while ago. That's what we call the attribute compatibility scheme, where the sequence parser can also take in a std vector or any other um, a, a standard conforming sequence. So here's how we um, dispatch based on the type of the attribute. And here's the first example. Four container attributes. This is what gets called. If we have a container attribute coming in from the sequence. Here's what it does. It parses into the container. We're using the same utility as we have for the clean star. That's what happens here. For tuple types, this is a little bit more tricky. And I'll just go through this quite quickly. Um, unlike Spirit 2, um, with Spirit X3, it's always a binary parser or a uni unary parser. In V2, we flatten the parsers. For example, if you have a sequence A followed by B followed by C, 
it's actually flattened into a sequence with three elements, and that's held by a fusion sequence. But in this case, for simplicity, and to make it very simple, we have only binary parsers and unary parsers. For that, uh, the, the question here is that how do we handle attributes? Because attributes are flat. So for example, you have A followed by B followed by C. That's a binary parser of a binary parser. And then the user passes in a tuple A, B, and C. For that, uh, the trick is to partition the attribute into constituent parts. And this is what's being done here. So uh, the partition itself is being done here. And then before it calls the left parser, it needs to get the right part of the tuple. And when it calls the right parser, it needs to call the right part of the tuple, what's relevant there. Uh, I know it's a little bit um, difficult to explain, but um, the following next slides will explain that a little bit more. Here's an expression. Here's a complex expression, sequence. We have one, two, three, four, five. But you have only two valid um, um, attribute types. The rest have unused types. This thing here, that thing there, th these are literals with no attributes. So the syn synthesized attribute for um, this parser here is a tuple int int. OK? Here's the expression tree for that expression. But now here's the tricky part. Here's your attribute. How do you pass that into th that thing over there and this parser over here? So you have to understand first that uh, these are binary parsers of binary parsers of binary parsers. So it's nested. So here's the outer nesting. That's the right, uh, left-hand side, right-hand side. This is the second level pertaining to that part over there, and so on, and so forth. So here's what's happened. When we partition, we parse this. This is the outermost level of the parse. This is the right-hand side. I'm sorry. This is the left-hand side, and this is the right-hand side. This has a new type. And this will have be determined that this one will have an um, att attribute of tuple int. So by parti partitioning, we use an, a fusion iterator range to get the relevant range pointing to this tuple, the attribute that's being passed in. And then the next recursion level, this is what happens. So this is the left-hand side, and this is the right-hand side. This so happens that this will have an attribute of int, right? And this will have an attri another attribute of int. So that will be partitioned into two iterator ranges, one pointing to this part, and another pointing to that part. Yes, question? Um, uh, it, it's, uh, okay, the question. Um, do we uh, propagate uh, the iterator um, partitioning of the iterator, iterators across rule boundaries? The answer is no. Yes, exactly. Okay, 
So here's the last part of the uh, iteration. Um, uh, sorry, recursion. So the last part is that this will be a new type. So this will be passed to this parser here. And this parser will get an iterator range pointing to this int over here. So a single value iterator range. So it works. Sorry, that's not the last part. This is actually the last part. So uh, the last part will be, this will be have uh, an int pointing to that iterator range. Again, partition from the original source tuple. This will have a new type. Well, same as before. OK, so here's the alternative parser. Almost the same as before, so I don't have to go through this um, anymore, I, I think. Same ET expression template, it's almost the same as before. Um, very familiar. Once you get to know um, at least one unary parser and at least one binary parser, you'll be able to write um, any types, any kind of um, binary and unary parsers because um, the scheme is, uh, scheme is the same everywhere. And this is the um, actual implementation of the parse function for the alternative. Um, I don't have time anymore, so um, I, I won't have to, I can't go through the details on how the alternative parser is implemented. So we'll have to fast forward a little bit. Uh, uh, this is a little bit tricky to explain, so uh, since I don't have any, any more time, um, if anyone I is interested, uh, just approach me and I, I, I can go through the rest of the slides. Okay, so um, I have to go through this very quickly, but here's the rule definition. Almost the same as before. In addition, we'll have the attributes and we have a na way to name. So it's almost the same as the toy example with a little bit um, complexity here and there. Type devs, naming, etc. But essentially it's the same. Here's the actual rule context. Um, because rules can have attributes now, we have a rule context that will have an attribute. Here's the rule definition, uh, how it parses. It sets up uh, a couple of contexts, a little bit more complex than before uh, what, uh, in our toy example, because it will have to set up uh, multiple contexts. All these contexts are accessible from um, the nested parsers contained by this rule. Yeah, question? Does no, it's all stack based. And um, it's very um, lean and it's very efficient. I have an example um, CPP file that shows that uh, optimization is optimis optimizing the code uh, amounts to having it um, uh, uh, a const. If you have something like um, in the example before where I have a context int pointing to int and it's taken in by reference, but in the end it'll all collapse to a const because of compiler optimizations. If you've uh, uh, used the uh, fusion map, it's quite similar to the fusion map and it's very efficient. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to repeat the question. <laughs> um, does, the, does make context allocate memory? Okay, the answer is no. Uh, nowhere in the library will you see a memory allocation from the heap, except for what? The TST, sorry, that's not uh, entirely true. We have uh, the symbol table which has a, a, a ternary straight tree um, imp implementation which allocates from 
the heat. But that's all. Okay, so finally we have the rule. So it's again the same as before with a little bit um, bits and pieces to make it um, more easier and manageable. Here's the same as the, what we had in the toy example where you have the right hand side being assigned to the rule definition uh, to create a rule definition. This is part of the rule. We've seen this before, so I, I don't need to explain. OK, so finally, here's how the X3 calculator grammar looks like. So first, we have you set up a couple of rules, name them. There's a bit of redundancy here. so. Um, Anyone with good suggestions on how to uh, minimize the verbosity, I'm all ears. But um, no macros, please. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the calculator grammar now. Almost the same as V2, but everything is auto. And then how do I compose that into a grammar? There's actually the grammar class. We didn't go into details with that. But essentially, the grammar class is just a fusion map containing these guys over here. And that fusion map becomes its context. So anywhere inside the grammar, you can access any of these rules using its ID. Question? The first one, always the first one. The question is, which is the start rule of the grammar? So um, the answer is, it's always the first one. So there you have it. This is the grammar class. Um, I don't have time to go through this anymore. So if you're interested, I gladly explain the details to anyone. Just approach me. This is how uh, you, uh, the grammar itself. So it's quite simple, in fact. I just don't have the time to go to all these slides. There's a lot, and that's my mistake. Here's the grammar context, which gets the rule using the fusion map. So there's a has key. I know that those of you who are using fusion map can recognize that. And there's your grammar context. So just using the at key to get the rule from the elements, which is a fusion map. And if not, it passes on the query to the next context in line. Uh, there are some more that uh, I have here, but um, unfortunately, we don't have the time anymore. So if anyone is interested, I'd gladly walk through the rest of the slides. But um, for now, I have to end this uh, talk. So anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>